why should we compare the two cities? And comparativists, uh, those people who do comparative education, are always saying, tell us why. Okay, so I'm going to tell you why. If you look at the Human Development Index, very similar uh, HDIs uh, for the two cities. Um, th and these are uh, very high score. Hong Kong actually spends more money per um, the budget than Singapore. And you might argue that Singapore is much more efficient and gets more for less. So there's, there's two arguments to that. Teacher salaries, there's a new uh, report just out, um, Education for the Future, and Hong Kong is ranked number four on teacher salaries in the, out of 40 countries, and Singapore is ranked number 16. Again, you might say that Singapore is more efficient. They pay less and get more. <laughs> so that's very clever. <laughs> Hong Kong students do well on PISA, but Hong Kong itself doesn't do very well on education, educating for the future. Uh, Singapore is one of the few countries in that report that does well on PISA and is educating for the future. So it's a very interesting set of comparisons. Uh, and look who's first and second. If you take science, maths and reading in 2015 in PISA, Singapore is first and Hong Kong is second. So uh, there are many reasons for comparing the two cities. So my question is, what can we learn from PISA and is it enough? This is the most significant difference. That is socioeconomic status. That is uh, this thing here. This is a complex measure that PISA uses. It's not just socioeconomic status. It's about six indicators of cultural and um, economic diversity. We don't notice many differences at all around, uh, around gender. In fact, uh, because this is reading, um, th there are basically no differences. But the more interesting thing about gender is not the differences between Hong Kong and Singapore, but the differences between boys and girls. If we move to mathematics, you will hardly know that it's changed, right? <laughs> Um, the variables are exactly the same. Remember, I said what we did was to identify the those variables that had a significant influence on student learning in reading and maths. And we find out um, exactly the same. Let me try and explain a two-level conceptual model of student achievement, since that's what we're interested in. Um, what do I mean by the two levels? First of all, a student level. That is, the knowledge, the disposition, the skills, the attitudes that individual students bring to their school. Uh, in all the studies that I know of, this is the level which most influences students, <coughs> those characteristics. But when those students gather in schools, the school might have an effect on student learning in terms of test anxiety, that will exert a negative effect on achievement. So if, you're, if our schools are making students anxious about these tests, it's not going to do them any good because students will perform poorly. Uh, the value cooperation, that is, yeah, okay, we'll cooperate if we have to. Um, and, uh, sorry, no, value cooperation is the other way around. And then gender. Now notice here, this is reading, and gender is positive. When gender is positive, it means the effect is girls do better than boys. But for Singapore students, um, they enjoy cooperation. When they have to do it, they enjoy it, and it's positive, and it affects their learning. Now, that's an interesting finding, I think, that when students enjoy cooperation, even though they don't value it, they learn. In Hong Kong, the most significant effect is from motivation, achievement motivation. I want to do well. Um, I, want to, I want to be the best that I can. Now, it's not that Singapore students have negative attitudes to motivation. They don't. They have positive, but they're less positive than Hong Kong students. And in mathematics, uh, we find uh, very similar things. This is the enjoy cooperation. Uh, I'm a good listener. I enjoy seeing my classmates be successful. I take into account what others are interested in. I enjoy considering different perspectives. The pattern we're going to see in the rest of this presentation is that it does appear very often that 
the effects that are positive in one city are negative in another city, or small in one city are large in another city. Now, the reading scores are really very significant and different uh, in, both, in both systems. Um, in Hong Kong, there's a 29-point difference between boys and girls on reading. In Singapore, it's a 20-point difference. So it's a big, big difference. And the average OECD difference is 27. So, so uh, Singapore is below the average and Hong Kong is above the average. So those of us who spend our lives working in schools and education institutions need to understand that a lot of the difference is about what young people bring to school with them. Let me come back to the two-level conceptual model because I'm going to now fill it in for you just to remind you of what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, find out if there are things at the school level as well as at the student level. So what is it in schools that might be effective? And the question we've got to ask and the reason we have to ask is are the groups being studied similar to each other? That is, uh, is each school very similar? Because if each school is very similar... There's no need to look at a two-level model because the school will have the same effect, right? Uh, there is a difference and the statistics tell us that there's a difference. Well, what is it that are school-level variables? Now, there are truly 50 school-level variables in the PISA database. We can only find these three. In schools where student behaviour is... In schools where principals think student behaviour is a problem, there is a negative impact on student learning. The other interesting thing is that school autonomy um, has a positive effect on student learning. In Singapore, instructional leadership, where the principal says, we have great instructional leaders, those schools seem to do very well. But in... In Hong Kong, where principals say that, there appears to be a negative effect on student learning. So we keep getting this inverse relationship in the two cities. On mathematics, uh, we get slightly different uh, results, but the same set of variables. Um, for mathematics, for Hong Kong, instructional leadership is negatively related to student achievement, and school autonomy is negatively related to school, to school achievement. But there's something missing in the model because you, there's 50% of the variance that you're not accounting for, right? I think if you average SES at the school level, and I'll explain that more in a minute, you might up these figures considerably. I want you to look at the figures in school level variance. This is for science, not for reading and mathematics. In Singapore, 60.9% of the between school variation in science achievement scores can be accounted for by socioeconomic status. 60.9%. That's more than the model, but it's, it's taken us months to construct. In Hong Kong, 40% of the between school variation can be accounted for by SES. So it's not that SES doesn't exert an effect in Hong Kong, it simply doesn't exert that effect at the individual level. We now have to go back and look much more closely at reading and mathematics to see if the results in any way resemble those in science. Because we think these figures are very serious figures because it tends to suggest that a lot of learning depends on which school you go to. If you can un unmask what we think we've unmasked by this data, that is a really significant equity issue in education, then surely the piece of data has a value. But you've got to get into the data. Well, what I want to do quickly uh, is put forward three additional arguments. Um, uh, one is called the culture thesis. Because there's still 50% of the variance we haven't accounted for, right? One is about family influences and one is about individual effort in um, Confucian societies. And the purpose is to try and 
tease out the context um, and how important the context is. We can't discount individual effort. I think those of you who come from a psychology background will know there's always that debate in psychology about is it, is it effort um, or is it just... In, is, you know, one explanation for why Asian students do so well is they're just so intelligent. <laughs> they're, just, they're just unnaturally intelligent. And that's why they do so well. Um, this argument, which I'm more inclined to, to support, is that they just work harder there's a lot more individual effort. Now, part of that goes back to the cultural issue of um, being part of a family, wanting to please the family, wanting to honour your parents by doing well. And so individual effort I is not um, such a uh, stark psychological construct as an important sociological construct. We simply need to know more. We need to know more than the newspapers tell us about who does well and who doesn't do well. We need to know more than just that uh, Singapore comes first and Hong Kong comes second in maths, reading uh, and science. That's nice, um, but we don't know why. And so what we're trying to do is explore that.